afternoon and welcome everyone. Uh, I am Rosa Cabrera, director of the Rafael Sintron Ortiz Latino Cultural Center, uh, also known as the, as the LCC. Uh, thank you for joining us in this online series called Latinx Women Leaders Across Movements, um, which we're presenting in partnership with the Women's Leadership and Resource Center to celebrate Women's History Month. Uh, the Women's Leadership and, uh, and Resource Center and the Latino Cultural Center are part of the Centers for Cultural Understanding and Social Change here at a UIC. Uh, we are seven cultural centers committed to advancing positive social change, grounded in the principle of access, equity, and social justice. Uh, and you can check out the work of the, of the seven centers through the link that we will be putting in the chat. Uh, pretty soon. Uh, today's program is part of a series featuring online conversations with four uh, extraordinary Latinx women leaders uh, from the present, centering their voices and experiences uh, on a range of issues affecting Latinx communities, including labor uh, and workers' rights, immigrants' rights, environmental and climate justice, and building transgender and queer, uh, and queer uh, Latinx power. Um, they are providing a glimpse on what leadership looks like across intergenerational and intersectional movements uh, and the action-based agendas and strategies that they are using to promote and demand policies to advance social and environmental justice in our communities. Uh, the conversation with these amazing women leaders and activists, our sister center, the um, Women's Leadership and Resource Cultural Center, and the participants, um, they have been sharing virtual space um, with us during this conversation have been impressive. Um, I have found them energetic and uh, unapologetic necessary. Um, as we continue to see hateful acts of violences against women, especially women of color. Um, that's it, unfortunately, um, you know, the six um, Asian women who lost their life in Georgia yesterday um, was a dreadful ad that screams to all of us uh, to be active in solidarity across all movements, looking out for each other in the struggle for racial and gender justice. Um, um, I am going to now pass the mic to Natalie Bennett, the director of the Women's Leadership and Resource Center, who I'm sure has a lot more to say about um, this dreadful ad that just happened in Georgia. <clears throat> Hi, uh, greetings everyone. Um, uh, thanks for the introduction, Rosa. And yes, certainly thanks to Rosa for inviting WLRC into collaboration around uh, this Zona Abierta series uh, featuring Latinx women leaders in Chicago. And as part of UIC's annual Women's Heritage Month, we typically spotlight the political, creative, and intellectual work that is happening at the intersections of feminisms and movements against white supremacy, colonialism, imperialism, and carceral systems. Uh, in truth, this is work that we do every day. We just make a bigger deal of it during the month of March. This is also WLRC's 30th anniversary year. And so today's program, uh, conversation with Kim Wasserman, the formidable and much respected leader of El Viejo, is also a reminder that WLRC's programs provide critical education about how women identified persons participate in and shape important movements over time, including the local and global environmental justice movements uh, with the interest of forging a more inclusive and a more just present and future. So, but what the center also does uh, is offer students ways of connecting with movements outside of the classroom and the campus. And so a part of the center's mission is to foster collaborations and connections between UIC and feminist and social justice groups in Chicago. And the idea is to learn from each other, is to build with each other in order to address the larger issues that impact the lives of women and gender nonconforming people 
who are marginalized by structural inequalities. I also wanna say something about the heritage in Women's Heritage Month. Uh, heritage is what we inherit and what we pass on. And so I see Rosie, Tanya, and now Kim as part of the heritage that WLRC and LCC are offering up to our students about what it takes and means to be, become and remain fierce women leaders, thinkers, organizers and change makers in the city and beyond. This series is made possible by uh, the UIC's Honors College, uh, which has graciously uh, collaborated with us on this and several other programs. And to, um, as part of, I think, uh, the ways in which the cultural centers work and uh, lift up and see connections between um, movements against inequality and against violence uh, and to stand in solidarity with each other. I want to also remind everyone or notify everyone in case you didn't already know that uh, one way of um, bringing folks together to talk about um, and share and think through what it means to respond to uh, violence against Asian um, uh, Asian women, and particularly the horrendous kind of murders that happened last night. Uh, the Global Asian Studies program is opening a space today, and Ramona will remind us about that at the end. But just in case you have some time or able to make space today from 4 to 5 p.m., Glass will be holding uh, space to talk about uh, the Atlanta killings. Um, on that note, I'll turn it back over to Rosa, who will introduce the guest speakers, and then we will move into a Q&A and conversation with Kim. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Um, with great honor, I am introducing our guest speaker, uh, Kim Wasserman, uh, who is the executive director of the Little Village Environmental Justice Organization, uh, better known as um, El Vejo, uh, where she has worked since 1998. Kim joined El Vejo as an organizer and helped to organize community leaders to successfully build a new playground, community gardens, remodel of a local school park, and force a local polluter to upgrade their facilities to meet current laws. As executive director of uh, El Vejo, she has worked with organizers to reinstate a job access bus line, build upon the community's work to create La Villita Park, continue the more than 10 year campaign that won the closure of two local coal fire power plants, and continues to fight for remediation and redevelopment of these sites. Kim is chair of the Illinois Commission on Environmental Justice. Uh, and in 2013, she was the recipient of the Goldman Prize for North America. Her biggest accomplishment, and she notes this um, with an underline to date is raising three community organizers age 22, 15, and 12. Uh, join me to uh, please welcome um, Kim. Uh, bienvenida uh, to our virtual community. Muchísimas gracias, Rosa. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, boy, it does sound like a lot when you read it. I'm like, what? <laughs> it's kind of, it's funny to remember um, all the things you do because you just get so caught up in the day-to-day. -day. But thank you for the opportunity. Um, it's always a privilege and a pleasure um, for us to be able to uh, join with UIC and with all these amazing uh, departments and folks at UIC. So thank you for the opportunity. We really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, getting ready for this conversation today, um, I was super nervous. I was like, oh my gosh, uh, don't want to do wrong um, by so many women um, in this movement um, and just really was like over, I think overthinking all of the things I wanted to say. And so I, I really took a step back and looked at the landscape that is environmental justice, right? Like who's leading this work, who's doing this work on the ground and what I was reminded of or, or kind of what I was regrounded in or rerooted in is the fact that it's primarily women and folks who identify um, as women who are at the front lines of the environmental justice and climate justice work. And that's not by chance. 
you know, the fact of the matter is part of the reason why I got into this work was because of my kids. Uh, my, my youngest developed asthma at three months. And that um, was something that I felt I had a need to fight and understand why this was happening and how could I make it so another kid, another mom didn't have to deal with what I dealt with with my kid having asthma and not having health insurance and not having a car and not having access to a hospital. And so, you know, as I looked across the movement, um, it's really women of color particularly that are leading these fights. And that's because again, women are at the front line of dealing with family health issues. There are a lot of times at the front line of dealing with home economic issues. Um, and so when things are not right environmentally, um, they're putting two and two together. And a lot of times as well, women in these communities know not just what the problem is, but how to fix it. Um, and I think that's something that I've really taken away from the last 23 years of being in this work is just how, how little attention is paid to the voices of our community, much less the, the female or female identifying voices of our community and how they're not centered as the solution and how much of a missed opportunity there is really to solve so many problems in our neighborhood. If folks could humble themselves enough to listen to what women in our communities are saying um, and responding um, in appropriate manners. And so, you know, when I thought about like, how do I, like, how do I talk about what environmental justice is or how do I share um, what that context means. Because for a lot of folks, you know, I can imagine that if you've never heard of environmental justice, you automatically think of environmentalism. Um, and I'm going to throw into the chat a link, um, right? Or people think a lot of times tree huggers, right? That were, that, that were just granola eating vegetarian tree huggers. That's some folks. Um, but, you know, I, I'm not a vegetarian <laughs> um, and I don't have a tree in my backyard, so I don't really hug trees. But I do appreciate and, and um, love the environment in which I live in. Um, and I'm willing to fight for it for my community. And so environmental justice in particular um, is a campaign or is a fight that's based on 17 principles. It's based on an understanding um, that we are living on Mother Earth and that their resources, that our resources from Mother Earth are being extracted at unsurmountable levels and causing climate change at its heart. And that the people who are feeling the impact of climate change first and foremost are the people who least contribute to climate change. And 99% of the times that is either folks in um, uh, the poorest folks in our world and or people of color in our world. And so the realities of environmental justice is that when it looks at the root cause of why these things are happening, it very much looks at capitalism and racism, right? It doesn't shy away from what exactly is happening. And what that means then is the solutions that we identify also cannot be caught up in capitalism and or racism. They really have to be based on community. They have to be based on self-determination um, and they have to be based on what is the, what, like I said, what community is asking for. So for me really in thinking about like how you talk about, about environmental justice, it's really to understand that it's probably one of the most intersectional movements out there in how it thinks about um, why things are happening and where the cause from them is coming from and how to solve them. Um, and so when I think about like community members or folks on this on this Zoom who are like, how do I get involved? What do I do? Right? Like I see what's happening in, in the Southeast side, right? With General Iron, or I see what's happening in Little Village with Hilco. How do I get involved? And there's a couple of things that I want to make sure that I leave with folks in regards to that question. I think one thing to understand is that many communities like ours understand what is happening, understand that th this is environmental racism and don't need folks to come in and re-explain that to them or don't need folks to come in and give them a different variation of like who the bad guy is, right? Like on the Southeast side, you have folks who are coming down there and they're like, you just don't understand the jobs argument or you just don't understand that this is really a different company. And the fact of the matter is folks on the Southeast side know exactly what's happening and can speak for themselves as to what kind of jobs right, are needed in their neighborhood. Um, and so one is just understanding that communities speak for themselves, right? And that in or even in our own communities, to a certain extent, we have to humble ourselves when it comes to how to best support our neighborhood and just hear directly from community members as to what that means. Um, it also means, right, not just parachuting into a neighborhood that's not yours, right? Like so many times we've been head up um, by students or teachers who are like, I'd love to bring a class of 40 people to come out and help you. What all do you need? Right. And as great as that is, sometimes it's also difficult because it puts it on us as a community to have to create things for folks to do. Right. Versus calling an organization and being like, yo, what do you all have going on? And here's what I can offer as, as any of this of use to you all. Right. And so that very much changes the dynamic and changes the way in which folks can get down. 
And thirdly, I would say it's really important for us to understand what those 17 principles are. And if you're not down with censoring those most marginalized, if you're not down with understanding the role that capitalism plays, then perhaps our organizations are not the right place for folks to volunteer at. Because the reality is we're already fighting so many fights in our neighborhood. What we don't have the capacity and ability to do and should not be put on us to do is also educate folks on like why capitalism is wrong, <laughs> right? <laughs> or, or like why, um, right, um, why like false solutions are not for our neighborhood. Um, and as I mentioned, one of the biggest things um, that really is lifted up within the environmental justice movement, as I mentioned, is centering those most marginalized, right? And that's a very different nuance than what you would find um, in classic environmental organizations, which are very much um, led by, usually by white males. Um, so as, as the executive director of VECHO, for a very long time, I had to deal with being one of the only women, much less one of the only women of color in many of these spaces when we were talking about environment or environmental justice at large. Um, and so it was really difficult to be able to, and exhausting quite honestly, a lot of times to have to engage in those spaces because we weren't aligned value-wise. They weren't spaces they were welcoming to community, right? You know, I raised three of my children through this organization and I can count um, on all of my fingers and toes, the amount of times that I've been in meetings in which I've been given dirty looks or just people have made it a point to inform me how uncomfortable they were with my children being in the space or having to nurse my kids in the room, right? And that's just me as one person. That's not even me as a community member trying to get into these spaces or as a parent trying to access some of these spaces. And so it just, um, I think for me particularly became really important that even if like, that it wasn't just good enough for folks who were coming to the organization being aligned with us, but also the people, the partners that we have and the folks that we work with, right? Because again, it's an understanding that at the root cause of environmental degradation, at the root cause of climate change, again, as I mentioned, is not just capitalism, but it's also racism, right? And is also uh, patriarchy, right? So it's really understanding, like, why is it that as particularly women or women identifying, we're led to feel a certain way being in these spaces? And how do we fight back to change that? And so particularly for myself and our organization, um, part of our work has really been around alignment um, with other organizations, big green organizations, as we call them, um, other social justice organizations, and just allies and even university partners, quite honestly, where we talk about, right, like, again, what those root causes are, but we also talk about, like, what does it mean to support community and not be extracted in that support? Right. And I say that because as a university, right, like there's a lot of partnerships that the universities do. But a lot of times when we're already fighting the good fight in our community and we have a partner come in, a lot of times the research or the support is very much is on an extractive relationship basis. Right. Like folks are studying us. They're studying what's wrong. Right. And then they're using that information to get grants or get published or, or you know, whatever that that might be. And what we really try to do is change the trajectory of that conversation to say, hey, how do we make what is it called? Um, intellectual property. How do we make the intellectual property of this um, for everybody, right? So that before the university can use it for a grant, they have to come to the community and, and be aligned and make sure that like they're transparent on the grant and the funding and what that means, um, right? And if community is gonna go out there that they're transparent with the university too, and how do we share ownership um, over this information? Because again, so many times our communities have been studied. And so, I mean, I, I can remember early on in my career, um, being asked to come to press conferences and it had nothing to do with what we were facing in our neighborhood. It was just like, well, we say that we work with La, La Villita, so we need some poor brown people to come out and just show face so that it, it seems that we're working with you all. And after a couple of those incidents, I was like, yeah, I'm not doing this anymore. Like we are not animals, like things that you can just roll out when you need to cover that you're working in community, that you need to say that, yeah, we're, we're actually hand in hand with this partnership. And so again, it became really important for us to try to fight for alignment um, with these organizations. And it wasn't just around values, it was also around things like procedural justice. It was also things around how are decisions in coalition made, right? Some organizations are resourced to be in coalition, some are not. And so how do we um, open up the books, if you will, on grants and people's capacity, to, financial capacity to be in these spaces and share those resources with those organizations that are here on, on their lunchtime or here um, you know, on break and are here not resourced. Right. And so it really became about actually putting into practice the values that we uphold. And there's another set of values that I'd love to share with you all. Um, and actually, I'm sorry, can someone let me know when there's like five minutes left? I forgot to turn on my timer and I don't want to um, over talk my time, if that's OK. 
Um, so I let me put this in the chat. So this is the second set of values that I wanted to share with folks, which are the Jemez principles of democratic organizing. And I think Teresa's on, on the call and just really want to shout out Teresa Cordova at UIC, who was actually in the room um, when these principles were made um, on the mountains of Jemez. And they really speak to, um, again, not just the value alignment, but how we intentionally um, work with um, each other and partner with each other. And there is one of the principles that is one of my favorite, quite honestly, speaks to how if you truly are in partnership and alignment with another organization or another group, at some point, your goals are reflected on their goals and their goals are reflected on yours. And so it's really important um, that organizationally, we're not just talking that talk, but we're actually walking that walk. And us organizationally, what that has meant is, um, folks uh, recall the Hilco implosion uh, last year, we're coming on the one year anniversary in which the city of Chicago approved uh, Hilco to demolish the smokestack at the beginning of a pandemic in one of the worst zip codes, um, we started to fight back and say, hey, this is environmental racism at its finest. Like you you, you literally impacted our community on Easter, um, or I'm sorry, on Holy Saturday with this crazy cloud of pollution and we don't even know what's in it, right? But we didn't stop there. We were also very clear on who Hilco, and who Hilco Global is, right? Hilco Global is not just a developer that's redeveloping Crawford. They're looking to buy the fiscal power plant and also the CEO of Hilco, uh, Jeffrey Epstein, is also the president of the Chicago Police Foundation, right? So it's not lost on us that the same individuals who were given approval to demolish Hilco in a, in a, in a primarily Latinx community are also the people that are basically helping fund the Chicago Police Foundation, which as we know, is continually putting the black, uh, killing black and brown lives um, in Chicago, right? Under the name of, of policing. And so it wasn't lost on us, right? And it was really important for us to be incredibly clear around when we talk about the devaluation of black and brown lives in Chicago, that we talk about it, not just from an environmental perspective, but also from a policing perspective. Um, you know, and you can even take it a step further also in thinking about how, um, you know, uh, the Crawford Coal Power Plant is being redeveloped into a 1 million square foot warehouse, um, one of the largest that uh, will be built in Chicago. And it's being um, leased out by the Target Corporation. So Target will have a warehouse there. But one of the things that we learned through, the, through this work was that uh, warehouse workers in particular um, have some of the worst cases of worker abuse um, in Chicago and in, the, in, in Illinois. And we learned that who primarily works in warehouses are black and brown folks, right? So then we made a third connection to, you know, economic justice, which was really looking at how is it that these workers, right, who are targeted as people of color, poor people of color into these jobs, right, are have some of the worst, and particularly the women, have some of the worst working conditions um, that we're seeing in Chicago, right? And so again, incredibly important for us to not just speak to the environmental racism that was happening, but to make the intersection to all of the other things that linked to this site and to the owners of this site and to what the future development of this site is. Um, and I think one of the most interesting things um, is it helped build that intersectionality amongst movements. Um, and it's one of the few times that I've seen the environmental voice as part of some of these other voices that we had lacked for a long time in Chicago, right? And so now you have a mayor who's making the wrong moves, if you will, in my personal opinion, on opening the schools, making the wrong moves on environmental decisions, making the wrong moves on economic development, right? And instead of hearing the black and brown communities coming together and saying, this is what we want, she's literally choosing to go with the wealthy and the elite in Chicago, right? And so I don't think there, there is a more kind of clear situation than what's currently happening in Chicago when it comes to schools, environment, policing, um, that our communities are very clear on what they want and this administration is choosing to rightfully ignore that and continue to prop up capitalism and the elite as a solution to the situation that we have in Chicago. Um, and so I think that for us as an organization, I raise that because that's that's how we see it. That's and and what we're looking for is folks who understand that and see that too and are willing to fight that fight, right? Like I don't want to get caught up in a conversation on how because Lightfoot is is um, gay and black, right? Like that excuses her from her behavior. In, in this case, because that does not excuse her from her behavior in this case, right? And so, um, again, I say that because it's really important for us as an organization to be clear on root causes um, and henceforth then what is the solution. And so for us as an organization, right, it's how do we empower, how do we empower self-determination in Chicago, right? Because it's quite clear that people know what they want. They want an elected school board, right? They want police out of their schools. 
right? They want um, environmental justice reforms. And so how do we actually change the law in Chicago to allow for more spaces for folks to have self-determination? And I will say that one of the biggest things I've learned in the last 23 years is in fighting all of these individual fights, part of what it comes down to is who has the right to say what gets developed in our respected communities, right? Who has the right to say what, at the end of the day, what gets developed on the land in our communities, right? And, in, in Chicago is pushing for more and more industry, whereas more and more communities are saying that's not what we want. We want different types of development. We want development that upholds us, that makes us safe, um, that imp that empowers us, employs us, right? And so there is a serious, for at least that we're, that, we're, that we're seeing and understanding, a direct connectivity between economic, environmental, health outcomes, and land development, and how the rules around who decides what happened in Chicago have a direct determination on that. Um, and so, the way what that looks like support wise is that we're fighting for environmental justice reforms at a citywide level and we're fighting for them at a statewide level. I'll flag that um, yesterday or day before yesterday, um, something called the air ordinance came out of committee um, and is now going to be in front of full city council. The air ordinance is a great example of um, greenwashing on behalf of Mayor Lightfoot, right? She's making bad moves on General Iron. She didn't even meet with the um, hunger strikers, they were on hunger strike for three, oh, almost, a, oh, they were on hunger strike for a month. She never bothered to meet with them. Um, and instead of meeting with them and hearing from them directly, she's choosing to pass this air ordinance that actually doesn't do anything to improve the air quality in Chicago. It's just the cover to say, hey, look at me, I'm actually doing something positive in Chicago while I fuck up, excuse my language, on general iron. Um, and that's a playbook out of the Rom camp, uh, Rom administration. It's a playbook out of the Daily administration, right? And she is just using that playbook too. And so, what we want to see are true reforms that come from environmental justice communities, that come from communities saying we no longer want to be sacrificed. We want an economy and we want a community development that actually works for us and is is regenerative and not extractive. Um, and so, the last link that I'm going to put in the chat is a um, graphic that speaks to a just transition. Um, as I mentioned, that really talks about how do you go from an extractive economy and extractive environment to a regenerative environment, um, an, an environment that actually supports people and helps the environment and helps get, and helps everybody be able to um, live well versus continually uh, to extract, not just from the earth, but also from the black and brown lives um, in our communities. Um, and also what I'll, uh, what I'll close with saying is that um, it also, for us, it looks like holding our elected officials accountable, which in Chicago is just such a difficult thing to do, <laughs> um, quite honestly. Um, but it really is about, you know, holding our aldermen accountable to what are they saying versus what they're doing. Um, and I think particularly um, as more and more folks learn about environment, as more and more folks learn about trucks and diesel in Chicago, which is just such a huge issue, um, more and folks want to know, like, what, what are the aldermen doing? What is the city doing around this? And what I can say is not enough. Um, and so, again, we are at the state level pushing um, for not just truck electrification, but also how do you how do you actually say to a city or to the state, this neighborhood no longer can have industrial development. They are already overburdened and cannot have more industrial development. You need to figure out how to develop economies in a different fashion in these communities, right? And so for us, it's really about where can we get change um, passed and how do we get support to be able to do that? And right now for us, that's seeming to come at the state level um, because just this mayor just does not, does not for whatever reason, um, even though she um, platformed or won the election on equity and transparency, um, very much is running away from the opportunity to build an equitable city and be transparent um, with its residents on who's making decisions for who and for why. Um, so that's kind of my little spiel. Um, hope that was informative in some capacity. Um, and just thank you guys for the opportunity um, to share in our uh, work um, and, and just the joy that is to do environmental justice organizing in Chicago. <laughs> Hi, Kim. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. Thank you for your presentation and, and sharing your experiences and knowledge with us and really reminding us how women are and have always been at the front lines of this work um, and helping us make connections between policing and the environmental climate justice movement that need to focus on local work and on extractive relationships. I am furiously taking notes. Hi, everyone. My name is Jorge and I am the Associate Director at the Latino Cultural Center Along with Ramona uh, from the Women's Leadership and Resource Center, we will help moderate this um, next part, the community conversation and dialogue so that we can make the best use of our time as we engage with Kim. 
Um, as a reminder, if you have any questions, please feel free to write your questions directly into the chat. Or if you'd like to ask your question out loud by unmuting yourself, please just write your name in the chat and we will call on you so that we can um, keep track of the order of comments and questions submitted. Um, Ramona, would you like to say hello and get us started? Absolutely, thank you, Jorge. Um, hi, everybody. Again, my name is Ramona Gupta, and I'm the Associate Director at the Women's Leadership and Resource Center. Kim, we have a lot of questions for you, so we're happy to get this started. But also, again, everyone uh, who's here joining us, please feel free to share your questions as well. Otherwise, Jorge and I are just going to keep talking. Um, so, Kim, you touched on so many important things. Um, one of the things you talked about a lot was, uh, you know, the, the local uh, political aspects of your work um, and who are fighting against here locally. Um, we also, in these conversations, have been talking to amazing women leaders who are working in different justice movements. Um, so one of the things we were wondering about is, do you see greater alliances forming between the labor movement and other action-based agendas and movements and the environmental justice movement? Especially in hope of moving forward, uh, the Green New, New, Green New Deal um, and a just transition vision. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, yes, I think we are. It, and it's it's just fascinating to me in the city where union started, right? Like where the eight hour workday was literally fought for that we're so far behind, quite honestly, on these conversations. And I won't lie to you, like it's a struggle. You know, when Hilco um, put in their application, you know, they brought out the labor unions. They were like, yes, we're going to build this bad boy and we're going to have jobs. And then when we started to talk about, well, like that's great for that temporary job of like construction, but then what about the jobs for the long-term use. And it was really interesting to see some of the members be like, wait a minute, maybe I'm not comfortable testifying. Maybe I'm not comfortable in support of this because I didn't think about that because I didn't think about what happens when my job leaves and somebody else's job starts. And I think that's really, I think where there is a lot of room for more partnership. And I think more alignment with the labor unions, quite honestly, in Chicago, which is not to be caught up in the short-term wins, but really what is long-term um, benefits for all workers look like. And I think because particularly Chicago unions have just been so brutalized by our city in the sense that they're kind of siloed and it's really difficult to get folks to kind of say, okay, what does it look like not just for your workers and your union, but for all unions and the potential for all folks to be able to be a union. And I say that because one of the first things we brought up to Hilco and now to Target was to say, look, like, yes, we don't want you here, but before we even like start this conversation, what are the guarantees that you're going to hire undocumented folks? Because that's who we have in our neighborhood, right? Like, how do we start to talk to your unions about at the pathways for young people? Because we have so many young people who are unemployed in our communities. No interest, just very empty promises. And I think that really speaks to like the misalignment that we have, right? Which is to say, I, we are all for unions. Like, yes, we have gotten massive protections. But when we look in the Little Village Industrial Corridor, we have industry, dude that have 15 OSHA violations in the last two years. And I'm talking like loss of limbs, right? Like I'm not even talking like just loss of limbs, 15 OSHA violations, right? And nobody's talking about that, right? Like, and so when we bring up legislation that says legit, can you consider somebody's OSHA history as part of whether or not you should permit that, right? Like if somebody has 15 OSHA violations, it would seem to me they should not get a permit because they don't know what they're doing. Conversation was, there, there was no interest because you know, we're going to lose business that way. Like, who's going to want to do? Business? Well, hopefully, better people than that. Like that. That's the that's the bar. Like that. That can't be the bar, right? And so, I think there's definitely room for conversation, but it's it's tough. And lastly, you know, again, we're primarily all women in this movement, and in the union, that's not who you're dealing with, right? You're dealing with primarily men, and so there has to be a way. I don't know what the answer is, but I think you'll find a lot of interest. And a lot of ways of figuring out maybe with SEIU workers uh, right now working with SEIU and warehouse workers for justice and other folks who are understanding that and I think trying to find better alignment amongst those conversations. Thank you for, for that, Kim. Um, as we continue to think about the sort of the need to be intersectional within our movement and more specifically, you talked about the links of policing and EJC and the devaluation of black and brown lives. Um, what impact has the increased focus on racial tension since last summer with the George Floyd protest, et cetera, et cetera? Um, what impact has all of that had in the environmental justice movement? Have you seen a greater or less opportunity for organizing um, due to this? And that's a really great question. 
I think that with group, well, so one thing is I will say is that a lot of big environmental groups had their kind of their curtain, they, they had their curtain pullback on the realities of whether or not they truly believe in justice and whether or not they uphold that in their organizations. And I think you'll find that a big number of big green organizations kind of got the rug pulled out for them, rightfully so, for just, you know, not doing right by the work that they do and and the justice that they uphold and, and, you know, the things that they abide to. And so that's one. And then I think two, it really was a wake up call for organizations like ours that are primarily rooted in a Latino Latinx community. But that's not to say that there are not black folks that live in our neighborhood. And it was really a wake up call to how are we talking about um, anti-blackness, particularly in the Latino community. And so organizationally, what that forced us to do was have to have some, to start to have some real internal conversations to figure out how are we bringing to bear what we call dismantling anti-Black racism in the community. Because we can't just be out here spewing out like all of these values and principles that we uphold, but yet it's not safe for our Black staff to be in, in the neighborhood. And so I think for us, it was really a wake up call to how do we ensure that we are putting into practice um, the best support that we can as an organization and then reflecting that out to our community. So I, I am I'm happy to say that that's work that we have very intentional work that we've started that we see ourselves continuing over the, the long haul, if you will, um, because what happened in Little Village was not cool. You know what I mean? People were not able to come home. People were not able to safely access their, their spaces. You had business owners and gangbangers and police defending their property. And then the next day, 5 was out there arresting the same people who were they were standing next to the day before. Right. And so it just was a hot mess, quite honestly of what was happening in the neighborhood. And so it just really um, pushed us to have to ask what is our responsibility in this space and how do we, again, best uphold our values and create spaces um, in which our staff and our community members feel the safest. And so it's gonna be ongoing work, but I say you have two spectrums. You have folks who were like, got the rug pulled out for them. And then all the way through folks who were like, no, this is a moment for us to be as intentional as possible. How do we dig in and start to do the hard work to make this happen? Thank you, Kim. Um, I have a question. It's a little bit more of a multi-part question that might be an extension um, of what you were just talking about. Can you talk a little bit about how you respond to generational differences in how um, elders and young folks engage with the environment and fight for climate justice um, and talk about how you and El Vejo bring people into the work and train them, um, but also related to you know, how you've done the work over the last year in what ways, you know, people are using technology more over the last year? Um, in what ways have the increased use of technology, the difficulty in gathering in person um, helped or hindered, you know, your organizing, El Vejo's organizing over the last year? So that was a lot. Let me know if any of that, if you need me to repeat any of that, but. Gotcha, I'm taking notes, gotcha. Um, so yes, we are very much an intergenerational organization. And what that means is we work with everybody from the little, little littlest nuggets all the way up to our elders. And a couple things I can say off the bat. A lot of people assume that working with young people is hard. I have news for you folks. People, in, what we call it tercera generación. I don't know how you say that in English. Um, elders, is that the, is, is that, I, I apologize for, I, um, Super adulto. I don't, I don't like the words. So, the, 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 say that again. Super adulto, thank you very much. According to Antonio Matorrell. <laughs> yes yes <laughs> it's it's been our elders quite honestly where it's been the toughest because it's it's quite like in the sense of just like um you know i i'm and i don't want to like how, how do i put this um We've been in, so nobody teaches us, I would say, how to work in community with each other, right? So when you open spaces like community gardens, there is this, un, like everybody's just supposed to get along. It's like, kumbaya, you're in a garden. It's like, no, no, that's not how it works, right? Like I literally am in the middle of feuds around, somebody stole my tomatoes because my tomatoes look better than somebody else's, right? Somebody stole my flor de calabaza because it's the prettiest one in here, right? Like these are the conversations that I literally am having to like manage it support our staff to manage and actually like have gardener wide conversations because again, right? Like what it, it comes down to like, how do we all work in community in this space, right? And how do we all respect each other's, not just each other's individuals, but respect each other's harvest, respect each other's way of planting, right? And so I would say that like, I never in a million years would have thought 
that helping community members learn to work together in community spaces was actually going to be one of the hardest things that I would have to do. And, and like legit folks, when I tell you that like I've been in a car going to a seed swap and with a car full of elderly women and I've been like, senoras, if you all do not stop picking on each other, I am going to pull this car over and I'm going to kick everybody out right now. But just because like it's just like the, like the OGs, they're set in their ways and like, carajo, they're not going to change it. And I love them to death, but oh my God, right? Our young people are walking the park. Like, let me just be clear. Our young people get it. They see it. They know it. They can call it for what it is. They have great ideas and it is an honor and a privilege to support them in organizing. They don't give me the amount of gray hairs that our elders give me, quite honestly. And, and it's not even like, like, no, they, they, don't, they, they, they don't want Target Warehouse. They don't want, but their bigger concern is somebody stole my seat on there. Let's, can we have a conversation on the fact that somebody came in here and took my scene out there? So, you know, it's, it's, it's a variety, I would say, of interaction that we get with our folks. Um, with, the gen, with the technology, woof, it's been a struggle. I will not lie to you. Um, this assumption that everybody can just go to virtual is very much not true. Um, we've had to do countless trainings, of not just our staff, but of just folks in general of like, what is Zoom? What is Google Hangouts? How do you use it? How do you schedule an appointment? How do you get people into the room? With so many folks on their cell phone, right? How do you access Zoom on your cell phone? How do you access Google Hangouts? We work with, uh, we try to work with a lot of young people to help support the adults in their households to be able to access the technology. So what you'll find is if we're having a community meeting at large, a lot of times our elders or our, our parents will be like, do you have anybody who can support me getting online? And we're like, do you have a teenager in your house by any chance? Do you have a 20 some year old? Cause if you do, that would make it a lot easier for us to help you navigate, right? Cause we can't go to your home. We can't necessarily assist you in person but if there's somebody younger you know, in your household or who's technology savvy let's figure out how to get them to support you. So it's really been around training up our staff and training up our community. I won't lie to you in saying that the what's up app has been a godsend quite honestly, to a lot of our organizations because people use that to communicate already internationally. So we really try to use that as a phone tree and as a way to communicate with folks. Um, and then lastly, we have been advocating for more funding to do a simultaneous translation of all of our events. And in fact, one of the things that we're trying to graduate to now is instead of having folks in Spanish just on the phone, how do we actually create a separate Zoom space for them to get the presentation in Spanish same way that they would get it in English, because we feel like it's not fair that some people get a visual representation and everybody, and folks who don't know English are getting a, a, a phone translation of the same thing. So we're really trying to figure out how to make it more just so that both languages can access a person who is speaking to them in the language that they speak, um, because you know some people are more visual than they are uh, auditory. And so just ways that we're thinking about how to better improve our um, this realm, of, uh, of organizing um, for us. And then to your question of training, um, you know, we um, institute a couple of different um, schools of, of, of thought, if you will, or, or practices. Um, we very much base our work on popular education. Um, we also base our work on something called asset-based community development, um, which um, started out at Northwestern. And I think now, I think I learned today is at DePaul, uh, which I didn't know. Um, we also do uh, train the trainer methodologies, which is very much similar to pop education. There is no one expert um, and how do we get folks to train each other in spaces. Um, we do basic community organizing. Um, and the fact of the matter is, is that we are, um, we're going to do anything. Like if you have an idea, we probably aren't going to say no to it, quite honestly. And I think that's what's made us partially successful. Is it like you come up with something, we're probably willing to try it. No joke. Like, hey. Eh. As long as with somewhat the you know, as long as somewhat we're gonna, like we're prepared, we're willing to try it. And so I think you'll find that like our training is really around what is the expertise that people bring to bear. It's not to say that I'm an expert or anything. No, it's just to say that I am just I have some information. You have some information. How do we share information? Um, and really helping folks develop their leadership skills so that they are empowered to be able to speak their mind and speak truth to power and be able to you know provide um, their thought. On, on what is happening. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a sense. And I'm sorry if I offended anybody with the third, uh, the, the, the third <laughs> conversation. It's just kind of where we're at organizationally. <laughs> yes. And even as we say that, we can still raise and celebrate our elders. Um, thank you, Kim, for, for talking to mm -hmm. me about the need to address our strategies and to um, think about accessibility along the way. Um, to maybe continue that, that 
um, stream of consciousness. Rosa has a question here. Having a healthy economy while maintaining a clean, safe environment should not be in opposition. And yet this continues to be used by corporations, the wealthy and politicians to protect their interests. Are you seeing any strategies that are working to dismantle this, dismantle, excuse me, this misconception? And I would say tied to that, we have a question sort of around politicians. <laughs> Do you anticipate any differences in organizing strategies under a Biden administration, particularly around on this topic? So let me hit that one first, because that one's a fairly easy one, yes. Um, I will say that initially when Biden won, um, we were a little skeptical and, and I'm not gonna lie, like he's still skeptical. Like he is still deporting people. He is still locking up children. So like, it is not all rainbow and sunshines with this man. Um, but he did talk a whole lot about EJ, right? Like he's out here talking about environmental justice. He did nominate um, uh, of the first uh, black male to head EPA, um, which was huge. Um, and so he has committed 40% of all resources to go to environmental justice from the federal government. He's been talking to environmental justice organizations and he has hired a multitude, a massive amount of environmental justice advocates onto his staff. So I would say that he's somewhat talking the talk. I think the biggest concern we have is that he's just gonna release this money to people like Lightfoot and just assume that it's all good. And I think that's really where we wanna make sure that his administration is hearing folks on the ground to say like, nah, homie, you can't just be giving life with that money with no strings attached. Like you're gonna to have to make sure that they're working with us, make sure that there's accountability and make sure that you're gonna pull that money out if they don't come correct with how they're using it. So I would say that th there is some excitement but just guarded excitement about what's gonna happen with him. Um, to your original question uh, around strategies around this, yeah. We're having to build it ourselves. I think that um, uh, in uh, Brooklyn, New York, there's an amazing organization called Uprose um, and Elizabeth Yon Pierre is their executive director. And they have just won a seven year fight uh, of massive gentrification in Brooklyn. Um, they are right on the waterfront. They have tons of brownfields and contaminated land on the waterfront. They used to be um, a lot of oh, mar maritime, mar maritime. It's, they worked on the docks, basically. They all worked on the docks um, and that community has now left. And they were trying to bring in, in this old industrial building, like it's huge, like our post office, like they're gonna have a school and a community and like a theater and like this, and it's just basically gentrify the shit out of Brooklyn. And so Elizabeth and her organization and the folks in Brooklyn were like, no, that's not what development looks like to us. For the, so they fought for seven years. And in that time also went out and found a solar company that was actually willing to come in and produce solar panels and wind pattern. And I think wind as well, um, technology, in this facility versus and put people back to work versus kind of doing a development that pushed towards gentrification. And so that took them seven years, right? Not just to fight, but then to also find a partner. And I think what you'll find in Little Village is we're trying to do the same. Like our, our future of our neighborhood, whereas the city is like, we're all about warehouses now, apparently, like warehouses, 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 and warehouse jobs for Little Village. Our alternative is to say no. Like y'all love talking about how great our food is. Y'all love being like 26 feet a second behind Michigan Avenue, right? Like y'all love talking about that, but y'all don't invest really a lot of a lot of resources towards that, right? 60% of street vendors come from Little Village. There is not one commercial kitchen in Little Village for them to use, right? So like, how are people supposed to be successful if they can't even access the resources that they need to come out of poverty? So in our view, instead of warehouses, what we should be getting is economic development that promotes large scale indoor growing in Little Village, that promotes more commercial kitchens so that street vendors can stop getting harassed by 5.0, right? So that small business entrepreneurs can start to make their own food products, right? Instead of more restaurants closing, we could actually have the potential for more restaurants reopening if folks were provided the infrastructure that they needed to actually do this. And in fact, we have surveyed our community over the last 23 years and what did we find? 60% of street vendors come from Little Village. 62% of residents in Little Village have a background in agriculture and don't put it to work. Don't put it to use in this country, right? Yet we have, and we have massive amount of land that we're not doing anything with. Please know I am not recommending that we should be growing and farming outdoors in Chicago in a neighborhood like Little Village. That is not what I'm talking about. What I am talking about is instead of building a warehouse for Target, how about you build some massive indoor growing abilities so that our people could actually grow food in Little Village. And not only would that help put people to work, but that would actually stop the amount of diesel trucks that are coming to Pilsen to drop off all the tomatoes and chiles and onions that people need. And in fact, they could buy them from us locally, cheaper and organic and save on truck traffic. So I like to think that we have a pretty good plan for a closed food system in Little Village. 
What that requires is somebody at the city to actually listen to us and pay attention to us and acknowledge that we actually know what we're talking about. Last thing I'll say is we were finalists in the Chicago Prize because although our mayor doesn't believe us, the governor's office was like, hey, that seems like a pretty decent idea. Maybe we could fund it. And sure enough, we were a semi-finalist. We didn't win. But we are on the path to try to figure out how to make that work in our neighborhood. Um, and like I said, this is once again where when you don't center community, when you don't center economic development and actually helping people get out of poverty, capitalism is going to do its thing, which is keep people in poverty and develop in ways that are not conducive for our community. And so that's exactly what we're trying to stop. All right, Cam, I have two quick follow up questions to that comment and then an actual like longer question. So two quick things just for clarification. Can you repeat the name of the Brooklyn organization that you had yes. mentioned? So folks Uprose. 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 Uprose in Brooklyn. Yep. Okay. U-P-R-O-S-E? Mm -hmm. Uprose. Okay. And then what is the Chicago Prize? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the Pritzker family, the guy who's our governor, they're loaded. Like I think they own the Hilton and shit like that. Like they own some hotel. Um, they decided that the way to get people, like the way to help people, when you have money, I guess the, the ongoing thought of process is like, what better way to help people than like to drop $10 million on them. Um, so they did this prize in which they were like, we will pick one Chicago prize that helps community development. And so they picked the one, um, on the Southwest side, which is, uh, Erica Allen's incubator project. It's really dope. Um, and there was. I think, oh, 70 some people applied. We were one of them, there were six finalists. Um, and at the end, COVID hit, they couldn't make the announcement and they were like, well, what should we do? Our suggestion was just divide the money up between all of us and call it a day, but they did not go with that suggestion. They instead picked one, which was great. The project is great and I think it's worth it. But um, you know, to make it that far on this crazy, it, it makes it seem, then I don't feel like it's such a crazy idea. Then I feel like, oh, okay, well, if these folks that are the Pritzkers think there's something there, then well, hell, maybe there's something there. Although I knew there was something there when our community told us there was something there. I didn't need a billionaire to like confirm it for me. But, you know, from a business aspect, I was like, okay, cool. Y'all buy into it too. Okay. Which leads me to then, because <clears throat> you're talking about, right, this sort of affirmation from people with money. You're also talking about, uh, you know, getting recognition on a state level, but not necessarily on a city level for the work that you're trying to do. Um, so I wanted to actually take this back to a point that you had made in your presentation. You were talking about the, the you know, the recognition of uh, a community's needs and priorities and their relationships with universities and researchers. And so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how El Viejo has been able to partner with UIC in particular over the years in ways that demonstrate the alignment and solidarity that you were talking about instead of perpetuating the white gaze or this sort of, you know, intellectual savior complex. Absolutely. Um, and I will say that this stemmed from just trial and error, right? Like I could tell you horror stories of like people, researchers, I'll give you the worst one. I had a researcher show up in my our office and was like, I've been trying to get a hold of you and you won't answer your emails. And I was like, well, if that doesn't tell you something, I don't know what does, right? So then he's like, I wrote a grant and I wrote you into it. And I said that you would do these three things and I'm going to give you $15,000 for them. So how do we make this happen? And I was like, wow, okay. You wrote me into a grant and did not get my consent for it. You wrote that we would do $50,000 worth of work and you only want to pay me $15,000 for that work. I get no proprietary rights to any of this. So then how I, how I, what I informed him, I was like, well, thank you very much for educating me on what you have done. I will be reaching out to your funder to let them know that this was not cool, that we did not sign up for any of this. And number two, it'll be $500 for the last 15 minutes of your time, of my time, because like, I'm not doing this for you, it's for free. So like, let's just be clear that like, you name it, we have had it happen to us in the sense of just complete like disrespect to our organization or like, can I pick your brain for 15 minutes and then I'm gonna go get a million dollar grant based on that 15 minutes of time, right? So like, <laughs> not cool. <clears throat> and so those experiences really got us thinking about how do we align better and set ourselves up for better partnerships with universities? So on our website, we actually have a document that we ask university partners to look at before engaging with us in a conversation, which is to say, have you already written your grant? Because we probably don't want to talk to you. If you haven't written your grant and are still in the idea age, then maybe we're more down to talk to you, right? Like, don't come to us fully baked. Like, come to us when you're still thinking about the ingredients, because that makes it more equitable for us to be able to engage with you, on, right? Two, We've had to really, um, UIC, I would say, has been most the most flexible in rethinking um, 
50 50 on grants versus like 20 what is it 20 80 on grants which is universities get 80 and you get like 20. we're like no 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 it should be based on who's doing the work and how much money it should have right so I would say that UIC probably has been one of the best in stepping up to being like, okay, here's a real representation of what the work is. And then lastly, I would say we have some phenomenal partners, quite honestly, at UIC School of Public Health. Um, I think Sarap um, Erdal and Vicky Persky, quite honestly, have just been complete lifesavers um, in supporting the work that we're doing and being able to point to professionals that agree with us and stand by like the proclamations that we are making. Um, so Rapper Dahl, quite honestly, has been one of the most amazing partners in the sense of being value aligned with us, um, breaking down. And I mean, this woman it has it, the reason I understand air monitoring and like air data is because of Sarap. Like she has sat down with us and like broken down information and is like, I, I don't need to speak for y'all. Y'all can speak for yourselves. And he, I'm just going to empower you to be able to speak to the science of this. So just. I would say just a real example of what true community partnership looks like, um, because, you know, they understand at the end of the day, the fight that we're in um, and they respect um, communities speaking for themselves. Um, and quite honestly, I think have been able to check their privilege and power um, in their positionality to say, here's what we can do to support you all in your fight. And I, you know, I can't ask for more in a partnership. Um, so definitely folks can check out our website and look at the values alignment that we have with university partners. And we don't always get it right. But we're trying, and I can say that we're actually now even changing the grant agreements that we have with our funders to say intellectual property will now be jointly owned instead of individually owned by the funder. So growth, I would say, in the spaces that we're in um, and how we're trying to change the exploitive narrative that classically haunts non-for-profit industrial, the industrial complex, quite honestly. Okay, and we're gonna try to sneak in one last question um, just so that we can make sure that it's addressed. Um, you spoke about the prevalence of white men leading environmental justice organizations in this type of work. Um, with this series being part of Women's History Month, how do you stay connected with, learn from, and build power with other women organizers? And, and sort of tied to that, Evelyn Flores submitted the question of, being that there are so many local environmental organizations in the city, how do these organizations support each other and their efforts? So thank you for that question. Um, so we, so one is, um, when I came into this work 23 years ago, um, I was surrounded by other women who were doing this work. Cheryl Johnson for People for Community Recovery, Naomi Davis from Blacks and Greens, and Peggy Salazar from the Southeast Environmental Task Force. And these women helped me become the ED and the woman and the organizer that I am today. And so it is incredibly important for me to not only stay grounded in continuing to connect with them and that as we grow, they grow with us, um, but also to continually stay um, checked by my community, quite honestly. So please know that like Inveco is not the Kim Wasserman show. It's not like I sit in a room all day and think about great things to, to do and then like we just run with them. No, it is based on our community telling us what it is that we need to do, right? Our organizers responding to what they're hearing on the ground and letting us know here is what community is asking of us, right? And so. You know, we never came out saying that we were going to shut down the coal power plant. It was, hey, there's some serious air quality issues in our neighborhood. How do we deal with that? Right. It was hearing in our neighborhood, we need another park. Right. So we fought for 23 years to get another park in the neighborhood. Right. And so very much for, for me, it's about staying humbled, staying grounded. As an organizer, it's really easy to have hot air blown up your ass people. Like it is really easy to feel like you are the expert and that, you know, the world revolves around you. And it is even harder to remain checked in that position and not let that power get to you. And so I really try hard to ensure that I stay grounded, that I am constantly reflecting and responding to and, and accountable to my community as part of the work that I do. And um, one of the things that we formed was the Chicago Environmental Justice Network, which is a network of all the environmental, of the environmental justice um, organizations in Chicago. And it's an amazing space in which we support each other um, and are able to be real with each other <laughs> about the work on the ground and support each other. And so I am incredibly thankful and blessed to be able to have that space to help support me. Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> Want to tackle it? Yeah, I can tackle it real quick. Um, it's been mixed. Um, whereas I would say with the coal power plant campaign, it was really hard for us. The Hilco campaign has made it a little bit easier in the sense of folks are clear that they don't want more trucks in the neighborhood. 
like folks, business owners are clear. Like some business owners are like, this is going to be great. We're going to get tons of, you know, people in our restaurants. We're like, who? Like who, who the truck drivers, like the warehouse workers who live in the neighborhood, like who's coming? Like really? Like who, who's coming? Who's coming? It's already not here. Right. So there are some business owners who are very clear and there are some business owners who are buying into the rhetoric. And I will not lie in saying that one of our biggest oppositions right now is the Little Village Chamber of Commerce. Um, they have single-handedly taken massive donations from both Hilco and now Amazon to basically roll out the red carpet for them to develop in our neighborhood in the, un, under the guise of saying this, we're doing this in support of small business because I guess small business can sell on Amazon or small business, I guess, can somehow tap into the target warehouse, I'm unsure. But right now that is one of our biggest um, their supporters of, of these campaigns um, that we feel are part of not just the environmental degradation, but also the gentrification in our neighborhood. Um, Discount Mall is a local mall that's being um, turned, converted into a target uh, store. Um, and that houses about 200 individual vendors. And so we see no support from the aldermen. We see no support from the chamber. Even though they're out here talking about small business, this is a direct space where they could be supporting small business and are choosing not to. Um, so right now, that's one of the biggest uh, um, oppositions that we have in what's happening in Little Village, unfortunately. All right. Thank you so much, Kim. We are out of time, unfortunately. I know these conversations are so full of goodness and we wish that uh, we could talk with you forever. But um, really, thank you so much for everything that you shared uh, and for being with us here today. We appreciate you so much.